Welcome, everybody. My name is Leif Anderson, Executive Vice President at Rhino Toolhouse. I'm going to just do a very brief, I promise it'll be brief, um, introduction to Rhino Toolhouse. For those that uh, are familiar with us, maybe you'll learn something real, um, real quick. Or for those that don't know us, um, hopefully this can be a very brief introduction. Uh, thank you for joining us on this St. Patrick's Day 2021 uh, for the wearables in the workplace. Uh, we've got four really cool products. Uh, we're going to be demonstrating them. Um, Emmanuel and, and some people in our Louisville office will actually be wearing this equipment and showing you how it works, uh, being able to answer questions. Uh, so I think this is going to be a really good format. A reminder that this cooler right here, this RTIC cooler, it's a, it's pretty large. I don't know how many gallons it is or liters. Uh, I think Steve's got a video on it, but at the end of this- 65 quart. 65 quart, okay. Um, we're going to be uh, giving that away. One lucky winner. All right, uh, our mission statement at Rhino Toolhouse. Our mission is to identify and deliver the world's most innovative industrial solutions. How do we do this? We do this for by providing local service, or excuse me, superior service, local expertise, and a high degree of responsiveness to empower our customers to be more productive, build a better quality product, and maintain a safe environment for the workers. I think that last part, the maintain a safe environment for the workers, um, uh, dovetails well with uh, with this seminar that we're doing, uh, but this is what this is what we do every morning. We wake up. Uh, this is what we're thinking about. It is about productivity, quality, and safety. Little history. Uh, the name Rhino Toolhouse. Um, there is a story behind it. Um, I won't get into all the details, but. Uh, the Toolhouse was founded in 1983 and Rhino Assembly in 2000. And both companies uh, were, were on a similar track. As you look at uh, you know, this, the, the last decade or so, and that they were expanding. Um, each, of, each of them had a vision of doing something that had never been done in the engineered um, solutions distribution um, world. And that is a nationwide distributor uh, that would be able to um, service facilities locally with expertise. Um, and that's something that they came together and merged in 2018 uh, to do that faster and to share best practices. And now it is one company, uh, Rhino Toolhouse. Um, there's some other acquisitions that were that were done along the way. So if you see some of these names on here, K Technologies, uh, Buckeye Tools, um, some of these, the, all the brand names will be going away and everything will be Rhino Toolhouse. We're in the process right now of, of doing that. Uh, we've um, migrated onto one ERP system and the next step is to get everything under one roof. These are our brick and mortar locations. So we have seven regions throughout our company. Um, if you notice on here, you have Louisville, Kentucky. That's where we've got our cameras set up and that's where we're going to be doing the wearables in the workplace today. This just gives you an idea of, um, the people that we have out in the field, our sales engineers, we have application engineers, um, regional sales managers, advanced assembly support, um, product specialists. These are seven regions that we have right here, uh, each region. Um, is self-sufficient in that it's got the expertise included in that region so we can get to customers quickly with any issues that we have or they have that we can come in and troubleshoot. So that's very important to us that we don't have to rely on any of our suppliers. Uh, we have that expertise in-house and we can respond quickly. All right. Um, We've got, we divided into 10 areas of focus, tightening and torque, material handling, collaborative robots, wearables, which you'll see today, 
uh, error proofing, AGVs, so automated guided vehicles, worker guidance, so some augmented reality, uh, worker instructions, exoskeletons, that's a form of wearable, which we'll be looking at today, pumps and hydraulics, and then we service and calibrate everything that we provide and stand behind it. So I won't go into each five of those because today's focus is on the wearables in the workplace. Um, this is just a kind of a illustration. Uh, this is uh, motorcycles, but it gives you an idea of, we touch a lot of the areas of the, of the plant from the floor to the ceiling, um, anywhere from collaborative robots to um, work cells, uh, pretty much everything you see on here um, that's helping support the build of that, that motorcycle, we're involved and in, uh, with providing that equipment and have the expertise in house to, to spec it out, to service it and install it. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Let's go ahead and get started. Steve, do you have anything you wanted to show? before we turn over to Emmanuel? No, I, I think we're good. Uh, take it away, Emmanuel. Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Emmanuel Varasi, the material handling specialist at uh, the Ohio Valley region. Uh, hopefully you guys are already enjoying a green beverage. If not later on today, you can. Um, we wanted to introduce uh, our wearable products uh, that we offer to you all today. Uh, but first, I guess before we get started on that, uh, a lot of you might not know um, what we offer and what really wearable technology is. So wearable technology is a soft or rigid device that a user wears close to the body, uh, and it can incorporate sensors, software, uh, or other electronic uh, devices to detect, analyze, and transmit information to another device. Um, and that is where the future of wearable technology is going to be going. Uh, but uh, there is another sector of wearables called exoskeletons, and we're going to show you three uh, today that is designed to augment the human uh, body to assist in very labor-intensive environments uh, so a user does, uh, doesn't uh, get fatigued at the course of the day. Um, so exoskeletons come in two different varieties. They can either be passive or active. Passive just means that uh, they're going to use a um, spring-style mechanism or cable uh, uh, tension uh, with a leaf spring to provide that user with, uh, with the assistance that they're going to require for that particular task. Um, so... And then active exoskeletons are going to be a powered device uh, via either uh, directly connected or battery powered. Um, so a brief history, though, on exoskeletons is uh, back uh, in 1965, General Electric uh, developed uh, the Hardeman, which was a big, bulky, uh, full body suit uh, that helped lift very heavy loads. But due to the technical limitations um, and the knowledge, uh, it actually took several more decades uh, to have what we have on the market today. Uh, so the first successful really implementations that have been deployed in work environments really have been in uh, rehab and hospital settings uh, because um, those, um, that person has already had trauma and they need that mobility back. So that's where we've seen a lot of the technologies kind of come from in our industry. Uh, so the military also started deploying or developing their own brands of exoskeletons in the 2000s to carry heavy loads over long distances. Uh, but uh, real world right now, they are too uh, bulky and also um, too noisy. So because of the actuations that they might need or the battery powered assistance, uh, you just can't have that stealth in that environment as of yet. Um, so why are wearables being deployed uh, in many of these industries? And really there's four main reasons. Uh, first is to minimize the risk. Uh, so it's providing ergonomic assistance, uh, ergonomic assistance, sorry, by reducing the stress and the fatigue the human body would normally take while doing that work during their shift. 
Um, it also is a supplement to the physical abilities uh, that can be enhanced or extended for that shift. Uh, so they'll be able to uh, work longer um, hours because they don't get as fatigued. And also it increases productivity because they are reducing the time it takes to do the task because they are also not getting as fatigued. Um, and the fourth is to provide electronic feedback. So uh, you've heard of uh, smart technology or the internet of things, so device communicating to device. Uh, so this provides hard analytical data and also an ergonomic ass assessment uh, that you can pull back from that device. Um, so that is where the technology is going to be geared uh, or going forward uh, in the future. Um, but right now, a lot are still passive devices because we're trying to get there, right? We're trying to get customers to get a feel of what an exoskeleton or a wearable device does uh, and then incorporate new technologies in the future. Um, so in a, a, a current workforce, I guess, uh, there's about 25 days of lost time that an average employer will see because of these uh, injuries or uh, the fatigue that a, a person will feel um, because they're just a very heavy labor intensive environment, right? So this is what we're trying to target. And um, the areas where uh, I guess we see the highest rate of these devices being uh, deployed is uh, where there is that high risk of injury being reported. Uh, the, also the processes where high turnaround rates or where a team member job cycles because they just couldn't perform that uh, job any longer. And then also processes where a lift assist uh, that we do provide or other ergonomic device just doesn't fit uh, or is just su not suitable for that work uh, uh, area. Um, and then other areas, I guess, where productivity and ergonomics need to go hand in hand. We have a few little mock-ups here uh, in our demo room here uh, to be able to show you that. Um, we are gonna start off with the uh, LEVO, uh, lower back lift assist. Kyle Hurst is actually gonna assist me uh, with this uh, portion of the demonstration. He is wearing a mask because uh, we're trying to socially distance and be safe about this. Uh, so he is wearing the LEVO device and if you uh, do a 360 for me here. You can see that this one uh, is very low profile. Uh, there's a minimal amount of product really on him. The torso tube is really what's going to provide that assistance to his lower back. So this particular exoskeleton uh, provides that lower back support uh, and it transfers the weight of um, the strain that he would be feeling from the lower back uh, from the chest pad up to the smart joint uh, down to his legs. So there is a spring mechanism here um, in the smart joint that allows him to feel that assistance. Um, so he can, re um, the reduction is up to 40% of that strain he would normally feel when he's bending forward, um, trying to pick up a device that's low to the ground. Uh, again, these are, uh, this is designed for an application where, um, maybe a paint line, we've seen this a lot actually, uh, where there's a dunnage container where uh, a lift table, a traditional lift table or lift and turn table uh, cannot be uh, deployed. Uh, so it, this task is going to help him uh, try to prevent an injury from happening to his lower back. Uh, in the smart joint, you are able to set the angle. So it's not just for fully bent uh, operations. I would be able to uh, set this angle for him uh, depending if he needed to be more upright. So it's from the zero degree, so more upright, down to the 35 degree while he's bending forward. So I can set that uh, to the particular task at hand that he would be um, using. Um, the torso structures are how we can size uh, the different uh, people. So about five foot uh, to about six foot four is the typical range we see in most exoskeletons. Um, and if you want to put that down, we'll move on here. Uh, the next one we have is the new knee chairless chair. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, this one's worn by Brandon. He's also assisting us. He's a sales application sales engineer uh, for us. So actually turn sideways for me. So this is um, an ergonomic chair that allows him to 
stand, sit, and or yeah, uh, uh, from a sitting position, be able to swiftly change uh, to a standing and walking orientation right away. So this one, this ergonomic uh, model is designed to, for 60% of the time, he should be seated in a work subassembly station where um, he doesn't have room for a traditional chair or stool. Um, and uh, and again, the, the seating heights can be uh, exchanged too if he needed to be lowered down to the ground. He hasn't had that proper training yet. This is his first time using it, but he is doing great so far. Uh, you do need to be more upright, and that's what gives you um, that ergo zone is that you're not leaning forward or slouching. You're actually in an upright, good posture, uh, so you're not going to be as fatigued, especially because there is no strain uh, to the, the thighs and the knees as you're in the seated position. Um, and the oh, – thank you, Brandon. I think that is enough now. The next device I wanted to show you is the Iron Hand. So the Iron Hand is developed with the uh, STEM technology. So that stands for soft extra muscle. Um, so it's easily able to be uh, tethered or put on like a backpack. And it was hanging. So if you do have a workstation and you really don't want that employee to have the weight of the device on, uh, on the person, you could change it uh, to be able to hang. So then there is no weight on the user. They just have to actually put on this glove. Uh, and this glove is a double glove process. So I do have my other one here. So this one, um, it incorporates five sensors in each of the fingers. Uh, and that's what provides my assistance. So this is the first uh, active exoskeleton out in the market. Uh, the first two I spoke about, uh, are passive devices. Uh, so that's the difference is those use springs or uh, actuators, I guess, to provide that assistance. Uh, while this one, I am going to be able to turn on and I'll be able to feel that right away um, as I press on my finger. So you won't be able to hear right now, but the five um, actuators are in my backpack right now. And that's what provides up to 15 pounds of force uh, for that full for the whole hand if I turn it all the way up. Um, so this device isn't uh, built to uh, give you additional strength. Uh, so say you could grip 50 pounds of force, uh, you're not gonna be able to do 65 pounds of force. It's just gonna help you with, with uh, 15 pounds of that force uh, when you're gripping something. So for this device, uh, say I was holding this pneumatic uh, impact driver and I couldn't hang it because uh, my work environment just, I couldn't get reach it, right? So uh, if I had to be um, at a different angle uh, and be able, or be able to use this tool properly uh, and hold it, uh, after a while, my hand will start uh, getting fatigued. So this is just going to uh, provide that support for me to be able to um, grip something for an extended period of time because I'm not doing the gripping. The glove is doing that gripping process for me. Um, let me turn this off now and move to our pro glove. So this is actually a, a wearable scanner. We're a little cockroaches. Oh, I think I hear some feedback. I'm not sure if someone's trying to ask a question. That old video. That's what we'll follow tomorrow, but. So the Pro Glove is a wearable scanner, and I just took it off the charger. It, uh, it has two charging stations or docks. Uh, it weighs 1.4 pounds, and this is to replace your traditional barcode scanner uh, that's a pistol grip type tool. Um, it does have an access point, um, and this has a 100 foot range. Uh, to the scanner. So it's a radial frequency, 915 megahertz. So once I connect to that scanning point, uh, and you won't be able to see this on my notepad over here, but it scans one and 2D barcodes. Um, and I'll be able to scan all these barcodes and it'll uh, translate it to my computer. So it's acting like a keyboard essentially uh, and transmitting that data back. What's good about the ProGlove is that the software, it's free. Uh, you don't have to buy any additional software. You can go to 
config.proglob.de and be able to configure, turn off functions that you might not want. Uh, say I only wanted to be, uh, read the data matrix uh, and nothing else on the sheet, um, it would actually allow me to scan that barcode a lot faster. So each scan can save me up to uh, three to five seconds uh, per scan. So if you are, if you multiply that uh, through thousands of scans that your process might require, uh, it's just going to save you time uh, and your ROI is just going to be a lot faster. Um, there is multiple um, uh, Mark series. Uh, so this is the Mark I. Uh, the newest series is the uh, Mark II. So this is the basic. So if it comes in a gray, it's going to be Bluetooth enabled only. Uh, and this is the mid range. So this is going to have um, a scan range of two uh, to uh, 10 feet away uh, because it has crosshairs. So once you activate it, uh, you'll be able to see the crosshairs, uh, be able to, yeah. And uh, that's just going to give you a wider range of scanning uh, for for that application. And, um, and then there is the Mark II uh, basic and standard range, which that just connects back to the access point. Um, but the newest model that we have uh, for the ProGlove is uh, the Mark display. So this uses e-ink, so it's a low um, low voltage, uh, and um, it's still going to uh, scan five to seven thousand scans per shift uh, with a two-hour charge. Um, and it's also configurable. So there is uh, an online uh, or there is a, a an app that you'll be able to download and be able to configure this particular one with whatever you want it to read. So. This would be good for any picking application, uh, any sorting, um, anything that you need a display of batch counting, um, things like that. It's just going to make the process a lot faster uh, for you and the employees to do that. And also, uh, if I did have to scan, say, uh, this tote here, I could do my scan, not have to put down that scanner, be able to pick up the tote and kind of move on from that. Um, so that is the wearables. I know you probably have a lot of questions and we'll be happy to answer those. But I guess uh, before we move on to the Q&As, um, we uh, did want to discuss, I guess, improvements uh, for the future. So a lot of uh, the companies have, that were the early adopters of these wearable technologies um, are doing so because they want to provide feedback to the manufacturers. Uh, and that's just going to help build uh, the Internet of Things, so to incorporate those sensors, to incorporate that data feedback that you're going to be getting, uh, which actually BioServo already is working to develop, uh, so you can get real-world data on uh, how that uh, process is, is happening to that worker, like uh, what, the, what they're feeling at the course of a shift, what it's assisted them with already. Uh, so your ROI on, on some of these devices could be um, infiniteless because uh, it's uh, it's just helping your uh, workers uh, do a better job uh, safer. Emmanuel, we do have um, quite a few questions. I, we do, and I'll I'll uh, I'll start listing those off. Leaf, uh, there were some sent privately. So, All right, okay. so first question here from uh, Thomas. On the uh, Lievo device, how natural is the sequence of motion to fully engage the spring? Uh, more bend at so the for head the Levo, versus the knees. I'll bring uh, Kyle back uh, over here. So the question was, um, how easy was it to uh, bend forward and back or down and up? Sorry. Yeah, so... Uh, no. Sequence of motion, uh, more bend at the hips or the knees? Um, so, so, it, so this helps with those improper techniques you see every day. Uh, it's not to eliminate that proper technique of bending down and picking something up. So he's still able to do that. And he's still going to uh, feel that support being more upright versus that weight being carried to that lower back. Uh, the device is actually transferring it uh, to the legs and the chest pad. Uh, so 
that that uh, that force that he's going to feel here is he's not feeling it whenever the device is active. So it does have an on off function and you're able to, uh, again, uh, change the degree of motion where it's being activated. Uh, so if, if he was going to be bending down uh, more on this pallet, we do want the assistance to be provided later on. Uh, so that's where uh, the change in degree is uh, at the zero. He's he's being provided that assistance a lot sooner. So he starts feeling that support more upright where at the 35, he won't start feeling the support until he's 35 degrees away from an upright position, if that makes sense. Yeah, so as you're squatting, it's pushing against your legs and, and your chest. Perfect. Any other questions on this one before? Um. On the back support XL, the label, uh, have you had feedback from females using this in applications? Uh, thinking specifically related to chest discomfort commonly reported in literature. Yes, so the chest pad uh, is a problem for our female uh, coworkers. Uh, um, so they are in development of um, the device being on the uh, being towards the back. So then it's uh, the shoulders that are kind of feeling that support, uh, but the extra mechanism uh, being geared towards the back. Uh, they're still developing that though. So this is the only viable option right now. And it is uh, intended for uh, a male process. Perfect. Uh, one question that's uh, related. Um, would like to hear about an appropriate exoskeleton option for heavy manipulation and alignment, i.e. rubber track install on a piece of equipment. I do not understand that question. Sorry, I'm not able to visualize your process. Um, uh, just uh, an appropriate do. exoskeleton option for heavy manipulation. Um, so the iron hand would be the only uh, one that would be able to kind of uh, be geared towards that because, and that's only for the hand grip really. Uh, there is none, no exoskeleton that exists yet uh, that's going to provide that uh, lift motion uh, in kind of this area. Uh, they're all geared towards a particular muscle group. Uh, and that is why uh, you know, these early developers do provide that feedback to uh, manufacturers of what they need to see uh, in the future uh, so they can help develop uh, and give suggestions on what's important to them, their team members, and that process. Um, so it's just helpful for our uh, customers as well to deploy some of these in the field so we can get that feedback back to the manufacturers and continue on that continuous improvement to try to incorporate uh, sensors and other uh, technologies, I guess, to help that. Um, but I'm sure someone's in development of one, but I just don't know of one that can do that yet. Thanks, E. Uh, do you have devices to assist with hand opening? Hand opening? No, currently these are the main devices we offer um, so it's only to grip something, but not really to open uh, the hand up. Are you aware of anything on the market for that? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Uh, do we sell any type of ergonomic software to understand what issues you may have in a production area? There is companies that can uh, provide, um, I guess, hardware really that you kind of put on a person. So it would be tethered to a watch. Uh, it has, uh, I guess, a little collar, uh, and then it can give you kind of what was good and bad in that in that particular process. Uh, we don't currently carry that line. We have been in discussions with them, uh, but if you are interested, uh, please email Stephen. Uh, or our marketing team, uh, and we'd be happy to kind of guide you um, through that if that is what you're interested in. 
Um, so how does the uh, how does the iron hand provide the extra grip assistance? Uh, you might have missed that. So the, okay. Um, yeah, it has five linear actuators. And sorry, I didn't take it apart to kind of show you. So right here, this is uh, the battery pack and the uh, power pack really that provides that assistance. Uh, so each of these, uh, there's tendons that run throughout, and that's what that soft extra muscle is. It's these nylon tendons that run throughout the glove, uh, and they are pulled and retracted to encapsulate your hand as you're gripping an object. The sensors um, give you that feel um, or give that feedback back to those servos, uh, the servos here um, to do that. So uh, the harder you squeeze, uh, the more it knows that you're trying to grip more and the more assistance it can give you. There is an, uh, a downloadable app that you can kind of configure that to the work environment because you can tether fingers together so they uh, move in conjunction with one another, uh, but also uh, decrease and increase the force that they'll feel per that, uh, for that finger. Uh, so you can com completely turn one off uh, if it's not required, uh, such as uh, the trigger finger, if you're having to um, go back and forth a lot, you can turn that index finger off uh, while uh, helping the others be tethered together. Perfect. Uh, would the glove provide ergonomic benefit for tightening steel hydraulic lines with the twisting motion? So a lot of these... Um, would be new case studies for us. So that I haven't particularly been involved with uh, on my own, uh, but that process uh, that you just described, I could see that functioning because it's helping grip uh, that cable uh, as you're doing that twisting, I guess, to get it in line with uh, whatever you need to attach it with. Um, there was an application uh, at actually GE and, and they do have some of these uh, where they're uh, pulling a cord and tethering it on a washing machine. Um, and that was helpful for that user. Um, so it seems like a very similar application. Question from Ted. Uh, is the glove a good application for repetitive cutting action with snips, wire snips? Yes, so the application allows you to customize that and there is a, a quick grip option that you can turn on and off. Uh, so if you do have to go back and forth uh, in the uh, open and closed grip position, uh, you're able to kind of adjust that for uh, uh, for that dexterity that you need. Thank you. A uh, question from Sarah. Um, she has seen historical uh, issues in connecting the ProGlove software to our WMS. Has the software had advancements in the past couple of years to allow for better integration with various uh, MWS systems? So yes, uh, right now it still connects USB and RS-232 um, via the access point, um, but there is new development in that software, um, which uh, there is, um, and I can't remember the exact website that you'll need to go on to, uh, but there is one that you can even um, access uh, how many, uh, I guess, scanners you have in, in your line, what the battery percentage is, uh, how many scans that they've done that day. Um, and, um, and I think we should revisit that with your sales engineer that provided those pro gloves because there has been advancements uh, in their software. Um, with uh, the Bluetooth versions, they still... Uh, prefer Android devices versus the iOS uh, is the only thing. Thanks, uh, Question from Aaron uh, for the ProGlove as well. What is the range of the scanner? The range of the scanner, depending if it's Bluetooth or uh, you're using the access point, is 100 feet away from the hub. Um, so if you have it centrally located, uh, you could go 100 feet one way, 100 feet another way um, from that access point. Um, Bluetooth wise, it's just going to be if there's any barriers between the tablet or phone you're connected to, uh, to the scanner itself. Uh, but usually we don't see any issues with the Bluetooth just because uh, most of those are either on a um, man lift or a, a, a fork truck 
uh, operator that has that kind of tethered already uh, to um, to that pork truck. Specifically, I was looking for the scanner distance to the barcode. Oh, okay. So there's different models. Uh, so the mid-range model uh, is about uh, really you can scan a foot away up to about 10 feet away. Um, the uh, standard range though is closer. So that's uh, about a few inches, three, four inches away up to a, uh, 12 inches. How does the glove interact with compact logic? How does this glove interact? Or no, that glove interact. I believe, uh, the, I believe the pro glove, the is that correct? Pro David? glove, uh, Ben, do you know compact logic? How does it interact? It's a keyboard wedge. It's a keyboard wedge. So we've explored many options to get it into many different things. Um, so we've explored options, but I think that's going to be a more involved answer for you. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you David, can send that uh, that particular question, or if we can ping that customer. Yeah, David, I'll make sure to uh, to pass that off to uh, a specialist uh, to get you an answer on that. A uh, question from Aaron, uh, sorry, a um, uh, question from Ted. Is the ProGlove networkable or only connects to a PC? It is uh, able to be on a network, yes. Uh, you can have up to um, really 100 scanners per access point, but uh, it's gonna, because it's radio frequency, it's gonna bog down the that data. Uh, so really 10 is, is the peak you kind of want to be at per access point, but it can be on a network. A uh, question from Janet. Uh, does the, the glove, uh, pro glove, have a window on it to see the details of what you're scanning? So the, the e ink does uh, have a window, and you'll be able to see, um, I mean, because you can configure it with the, uh, um, up to two lines of what you want to say. And once you do the first scan, it'll tell you uh, what you do, need to do next. So say uh, you were trying to do sorting, uh, so you would, uh, it would tell you what bay to go to. You would uh, scan that bay, uh, and then it would tell you where to put it, um, if that is your question. Hopefully that answers that. Yeah, I, I think specifically just seeing uh, the items that you are, are scanning in details. Yeah, um, so it can also give you batch counting. So if you had eight out of 10 that you need to pick, it, it would show you that. And you dictate what it wants to show. Perfect. Uh, so a question from Scott. Uh, wh what is the most appropriate device to assist in working overhead all shift, as in uh, drilling and installing screws overhead? So an overhead lifting device, sort of uh, like an uh, upper body exoskeleton really is what I meant to say. Um, we still have the exo vest. Uh, it wasn't one uh, because we've had it for years. Um, wasn't one that uh, we are doing today, but we do have that option as well. Um, and that provides up to um, 15 pounds of assistance and there's different uh, nitrogen cartridges that you can reach up to that point, uh, depending on the application. So if it was a lighter tool, uh, there is a five to seven pound uh, nitrogen cartridge you could put on there uh, to help assist the arms be raised and elevated for extended periods of time, um, making them feel uh, weightless. Perfect. Uh, question from Paul. How does the iron hand withstand vibrations from air driven hand tools? Uh, they use a lot of handheld belt grinders and deburring tools? So that is why it was primarily designed for is those uh, heavy intensive grip environments. So uh, over time, when you're dealing with a grinder, uh, such as this one, uh, it is pneumatically powered, uh, you feel a lot of vibration. So really what the glove is designed to do is for the user not to have to hold the actual tool. It's the glove itself that's 
uh, gripping around the tool. Your fingers are kind of just there. So if we, uh, if we, I guess, set the correct settings on the app uh, to give that uh, user the best feel, uh, then he should, he or she should only be able or have to kind of barely grip on to that tool and it'll hold it kind of for them. Um, but we do have demo units of all these devices. Uh, so please feel free to uh, reach out to us or your uh, sales engineer and we'd be happy to uh, do that demonstration uh, for your team members. Yeah, I, I think they were talking more to the vibrations from the tool. How does that affect the hand uh, with the pro glove or the iron hand? Um, so, so the iron hand has a locking tendency you can add. Uh, so once the sensors start feeling any um, any weight around them, they'll start gripping that tool. So then, um, and because it's a, uh, you can tether different fingers together, um, then you actually have to think about releasing that grip uh, and, and try to force it open versus, um, and you can kind of define that. So there's a sensitivity level that you can turn up or down depending on how much force you want applied. Um, and uh, if there is a lot of vibration, you can turn that sensitivity uh, up so or uh, down, I guess, so it doesn't want to um, open um, for you. Uh, it'll stay encapsulated uh, during that vibration. Yeah, hopefully, <clears throat> hopefully that answered your your question. Um, can time measurements be collected uh, of a repeated cycle of motion? I believe this was for the ProGlove. So the ProGlove already has a lot of data that is being stored and not really utilized. Uh, so that's why their new software program that they're offering, um, there is a free trial you can sign up for uh, if you already have ProGloves in your facility. Uh, so you can track uh, how many scans uh, were completed in a certain station uh, and which ones are online, offline, things like that. So you can kind of uh, build a process of uh, what products were coming in uh, that slowed maybe uh, a particular area down because there wasn't as many scans one day to the next or a particular user um, having less scans than another of what was going on uh, between those scans. So you're able to log or access that data uh, in real time uh, as they're doing their scans and be able to see your uh, that flow Perfect. Um, question from David. Uh, how long do the batteries last in the, uh, the ProGlove unit? So it's depending on what model you're going to get, uh, the basic uh, is around 5,000 scans, while the uh, MARC uh, standard and, and mid-range models can do seven to 8,000 scans. Uh, and uh, full charge time is uh, in uh, about two hours. So they can last all day because they do have uh, sleep modes as well. Uh, so after a certain amount of time, it'll just go to sleep and you'd have to press the trigger to wake it back up. Um, and as long as, uh, depending on the configuration you did on the free web, uh, website, you'd be able to configure it. So uh, it either disconnects from the access point whenever you put it on the charger uh, or if it remains active, uh, but it does still go to sleep uh, in those two instances. Perfect. Uh, question from Benjamin. Uh, they're looking for a product to assist workers with maneuvering uh, employees lifting a 40 pound drive shaft from waist to overhead level. What would be the best option? So that I would recommend a manipulator. Uh, and reason being is uh, if you want it to be a one man process and not a two man process, there's still weight limitations that each um, company uh, that we do business with has. Uh, so it might be 15 pounds at one location, 20 pounds in another. So we don't want you incorporating any of these devices to try to increase that capacity. Uh, it should still be whatever that uh, the team member um, or user is doing uh, not to increase that load. Um, so we can provide lift assist. Uh, that's why our material handling uh, slide deck is, uh, is here as well. Um, 
Great. Uh, what type of wearables are in use in assembly plants for installing wheels on a vehicle, for example? So that's going to be mostly a uh, lift assist, uh, like I mentioned before. Uh, so it's going to be able to grip that wheel and do that installation. It's not going to be a manual process unless it was the smallest facility. Um, and if it was, I would still recommend uh, a lift assist device unless you can't unless it doesn't fit in the area um, or there is no other way around it by putting any other material handling device in that area. So these are very specific to areas where we can't get around it with a lift and turntable with a lift assist. Um, so the application has to be correct, right? So if I want to use the Levo, it needs to be uh, improper bending position uh, and that I, I know I can't solve any other way uh, so I'm going to incorporate an exoskeleton to assist the user doing that function because over time they're going to get injured. And that's what these are de kind of designed to do to prevent uh, any injury by promoting some ergonomics uh, in, in the actual user. And Perfect. And we, we just have uh, two more questions here, it looks like. Uh, will the exoskeleton future developments allow feedback to supervisors so as to help determine who is working and who is not? So we believe so uh, because the uh, pro glove um, that they're just releasing next week would be able to do that. So if you had that scanner uh, on particular shifts uh, and then you know someone was supposed to be using one, you'd be able to see how many scans they did that day and uh, uh, and be able to kind of track their flow throughout uh, your factory floor. Uh, the Iron Hand as well uh, is designed to give uh, feedback and they're uh, also in development of the application to provide that in real time versus having to go back and pull that information out of the uh, power pack um, because right now you'd have to connect at USB to kind of gather that information, information see how many actual um, I guess, actuations uh, each finger kind of received in order to dictate uh, how much force it was applying towards a particular process. So, yeah, so yes, we do hope uh, that maybe that is going to be the case of uh, where your productivity is going down in certain areas and, and where you've seen that uh, increase. Thank you, Ian. And the last question, and we will get to the drawing right after this. Uh, can the gloves communicate with open protocol? For example, could we turn it on and off depending on the task being completed? Yes, yeah, so the, if you're connecting with the access point, it has to be nearby and connected um, to the main hub, I guess. If it's far away, we do have to, and we're uh, working on a particular customer right now with that uh, because it, the controller uh, is wireless and they're using their wireless system um, that uh, we might need to build a PLC, but we're still working on on how to get around that so it communicates throughout the plant. Perfect. Um, all right, let's uh, let's get to the drawing here. So we do have a winner, uh, Steve Wraith. Uh, Steve Wraith is, is the lucky winner for the cooler. Um, Steve. Congratulations, Steve. Yeah, congrats. Congrats, Steve. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's a great cooler. We'll make sure to get your information and uh, get this out to you uh, quickly here. So, so thank you, everybody, for your time. And uh, appreciate uh, you guys being on the uh, line with us and hope to do this again. Yeah, thank you, everyone, and, and we'll see you on the next demo. Thank you, everybody. Nice job, Emmanuel.